Well, hi there, and welcome to our study on the Lighthouse Discord server on the Book of Psalms. And we're on Psalm 51. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, what an honor and a blessing it is to gather together in your name to study your word, Lord. Thank you for the commentaries that we have. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for making it alive. Thank you, Lord, for truly being in our lives and for loving us and just for, for caring for us the way that, that you do. We ask that you would be part of our study tonight. We ask that we would be changed, renewed, transformed in you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and all the thanksgiving. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So we're starting with Psalm 51, and I always read from the NASB. That's my preference. And it reads as follows. A contrite sinner's prayer for pardon. And it was written for the choir director. A Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise for you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken, broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So Psalm 51 is the first in a series, <coughs> excuse me, of 10 Psalms that are songs designed to help us face danger, attack, failure, and loss. And they keep us focused on the Lord in difficult times. Now, honestly, these are songs that we all need at times. And the biblical songwriters give us the words to express our fear and panic and faith to God. We may have already passed through some of these valleys. I know I sure have. And the songs in this chapter of, of our commentary will help us to have a proper perspective on the experiences of the past. Now, 
more than likely, especially on our Discord server, The Lighthouse, most will have yet to face these dangers, but we will know where to turn for help when the day of trouble comes. And I've been, you know, an example of this is I've been in DM with someone quite consistently the last several months who has a family member who I don't really know the diagnosis, but they've been failing and they seem to, this person picks up and then kind of the health fails again. And it's not always just physical, but it's much like the kinds of situations that I'm experiencing with my own husband's health. And because of what I've been through, I've lost both of my parents. I don't have, you know, grandmothers anymore. Never knew my grandfathers at all because um, they had passed away when my parents were both young, et cetera, et cetera, that this person feels free to come and talk to me about these matters because I've been through them. And I think that when we've gone through a circumstance, when we've leaned on the Lord for his help, these are times when, you know, we need to examine our hearts and have, like, examine them ourselves, but also for God to examine them. And sometimes our hearts are broken in these painful circumstances. And then the Lord changes us. And these are the kinds of experiences that we can help others with along the way. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens. So I say all of that just to encourage us to remember to be there for our brothers and sisters in Christ who might need a kind word or an encourage, note of encouragement. So Psalm 51 was written by David and it had been, it was written after he had been confronted by the prophet Nathan about his sins of adultery and murder. Of course, you know, he went into Bathsheba after he had killed Bathsheba's husband. And Psalm 51 has actually become a model prayer for asking God to forgive us and has traditionally been included as one of the seven penitential psalms. That's not a term that I've heard used in any of the churches I've been in, but I know that some denominations very much focus on penitence. So, you know, what happened is from his palace roof, one spring evening, and that the story, the account is in 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 5. David saw a beautiful woman bathing next door, and he desired her so strongly that he sent for her, and he had a sexual liaison with her. So, you know, that's two of God's commandments broken coveting your neighbor's wife, and committing adultery. Exodus 20, verses 17 and 14, you know, talk about both of those things. So when his lover became pregnant, David had her husband sent into the fiercest part of the battle, and just as David planned, the husband was killed. So check off another commandment, murder. Also in Exodus 20, this time verse 13. So... Then in what appeared to others to be an act of kindness and care, David, David took the neighbor Bathsheba as his own wife. And he thought everything was cool, but you see, someone had witnessed the whole affair. And that person waited a while to see if David would repent and admit his sin. But David just went on pretending everything was fine. Then one day, God's prophet Nathan came to David with the news that the Lord had seen it all. And that, of course, that account is in 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 through 4. So confronted with his sin, David confessed. He admitted his wrong and accepted the consequences. And the penalty for such a sin was death, but God in mercy allowed David to live. And the child born from his sin with Bathsheba, however, died. Now, Something that I think 
many that I've run across doing ministry on Discord is that there are many seem to think that they can get away sinning and doing as they please and that no one's going to know any better. But the reality is that God knows every single thing we say and do. So I think that it's important for us to keep that in mind, that as we go about our day doing whatever it is we may be doing, that we are in a state of repentance and asking the Lord to forgive us when we do something wrong. Now, Victor Hamilton wrote, the Ten Commandments are not open to review and or revision by any advisory panel that may freely abandon them if convenience warrants. They have linguistic, linguistically a built-in permanence. Obsolete, they are not. Absolute, they are. And isn't that true? But David used three words in this psalm to describe his failure. The first is transgression, which means to deliberately break through the boundary of God's law. The second term he used is sin, which means to fall short of what God requires. And the third is iniquity, which is an act that springs from the inner twistedness of our human nature. And then in parallel to his failures, David also told us the aspects of God's character that provides the foundation for his forgiveness. God's mercy, God's unfailing love, and God's great compassion. And then David goes further and tells us how God views our sin after we confess it. Our transgressions are blotted out. That is, they're erased from God's record book. Our iniquities are washed away, like stains rinsed out of a cloth. And our sins are cleansed or purified before God. I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding that. And I've had folks DM me and say, you know, I've committed this sin. About, it wasn't that long ago that someone said, you know, they failed God. They think they should leave the server. They, you know, all of these things because they messed up. But we need to understand that none of us are perfect. All fall short of the glory of God. All of us sin at one time or another when we do, when we go to the Lord in genuine repentance. He will forgive us. He cleanses our sin. And I, I always feel so sad when people don't understand that. So there was honest confession here because Nathan assured David of God's forgiveness the moment that David admitted his sin. And this psalm is a record of David's confession. And some people think that forgiveness is easy and they flippantly ask God to forgive me for anything I've done wrong today and off they go. But they need, they need, we need to read Psalm 51 because confessing sin to God means to say the same thing about our sin that God says about it. David called it by its name, and honestly, so should we. Because as much as the sin was against Bathsheba and her husband, Uriah, David realized that in the ultimate sense, the sin was against God. Now, 1 John 1, 9 promises that when we confess our sin, God is faithful to forgive. But don't skimp on the confessing part. We don't have to beg God to forgive us because his grace is abundant. But when we follow David's pattern in confession, we recognize how much our sin hurts our father and how big a price Jesus paid to wash us clean from sin's stain. 
I think sometimes we don't think about that. Jesus literally gave his life for our sin. Now, our commentator relates this story, and it kind of is similar to a story that I, or something that I experienced several years ago in doing ministry in care homes and retirement residences. But he wrote, I talked today to a woman on the doorstep of death, and she confessed to me that more than 40 years ago, she'd been unfaithful to her husband, and she'd carried the guilt of that sin all those years. And her question was, will God forgive me? And he wrote, writes, I pointed her to the only answer for a guilty conscience, the cleansing power of Jesus. I told her how Jesus had died for her sin and for mine and how we can be made whole again by believing in him. And as this frail woman lifted her tear-filled eyes to heaven in faith, her burden of guilt vanished. Now, the experience I had was a 95-year-old man had never heard of Jesus before, really. They'd never attended church, but he was there at the service that day that I had held. And I went around and I shook everyone's hands, as I always did. And this, is, of course, was before COVID. And he asked now to be brought to talk to me and he was in one of these big wheelchairs I they're special and I can't recall the name of them but people basically live in them when they're not sleeping and uh and he he talked to me about what was on his mind and I had the blessing and honor of sharing about the forgiveness that God gives us through what Jesus had done. And that day, his name was Mike, that day Mike accepted Christ. I learned probably a month later that within a week or two, Mike had passed away. But I believe that I will see him in heaven. And it was his face, the change in his demeanor, even from the moment that we had first begun talking to after he had received Christ was something else. You see, the healing medicine of forgiveness works only on the clean wound of genuine repentance. I love Chuck Swindoll, and he said, all sins are forgivable when confessed and forsaken, but some sins carry tremendous ramifications the awful, sometimes lingering consequences. David died hating the day he fell into bed with Bathsheba because of the constant conflicts and consequences that resulted. But down inside, he knew that the God of Israel had forgiven him and had dealt with him in grace. And I just want to say over the time that I've been leading studies and really getting more into the word that, you know, David was, or Jesus followed in David's bloodline, the human aspect of Jesus. And it's interesting how Jesus' bloodline wasn't perfect, right? From the moment of creation and Adam and Eve and right through Cain and Abel and down the line, we can see that there were sin-filled people or people who sinned along the way, but were still in Jesus' bloodline. And I find that a tremendous encouragement because not all of us are perfect. Not, none of us really are. But I hope you understand what I'm saying, that God can use anyone for his glory and honor if we let him. So our next psalm is Psalm 52. And it reads as follows. Futility of boastful wickedness. 
for the choir director, a mass skill of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast an evil, O oh mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, a worker of deceit. You love evil more than good falsehood more than speaking what is right. Selah, you love all words that devour, O oh deceitful tongue, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah, the righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him saying, behold the man who would not make God his refuge but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. But as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will, go, I will give you thanks forever because you have done it. And I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. May God that is blessing to the reading of his word. So Psalm 52 sort of takes us in a different direction. It's another Psalm of David. And it's a response to one of the greatest crimes in the Bible. And that story is talked about in 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. And this is a wisdom Psalm, which means we should pay attention to it. And the links is that the first of four psalms called Mashil, M-A-S-C-H-I-L, or contemplation psalms, which provide instructive observations in life. Now, we've probably all known a person like the subject of Psalm 52. It might be the boss's yes man, it could be the loan sharks collector, the thug, you know, we might only know this from movies, but the thug willing to do anything that the head man wants. Well, in this case, the hit man is Doeg, the Edomite. Doeg is mentioned in 1 Samuel 21, 7, and the Edomites were from the nation of Edom, one of Israel's enemies. And honestly, his story is one of the worst in scripture. And kind of here's how it went down. The tabernacle, the worship center in Israel at this time, was located in the village of Nob. The priests of the Lord lived there. The whole family led by, uh, I can't say this properly, Ahitub, or Ahitub, A-H-I-T-U-B. And I apologize for stumbling over it, but I don't know how to quite say it. But it means father. And Ahimelech, the son. And David was on the run from Israel's king, Saul. David came to Ahimelech at the tabernacle of the Lord and asked for several favors, bread for his men, a sword to protect himself, and a word of blessing from the Lord. This wasn't a shining day in David's life either because he was pretty much deceptive in how he represented himself to the priest. Ahimelech, in innocence, granted all three requests. But unfortunately, standing in the crowd watching was one of Saul's men, and he saw the whole thing. Doeg was Saul's chief shepherd, the man in charge of Saul's flocks. And in reality, he handled Saul's wealth since wealth was measured in flocks and herds and not in stocks and bonds. So Doeg, of course, told Saul everything. And Saul confronted Ahimelech, and the priest defended his decision to help David. And in a rage, Saul ordered his men to kill Ahimelech and his family. And the soldiers wisely refused to harm the priests of the Lord. Doeg, seeing his chance to kiss up to Saul big time, volunteered. So he slaughtered 85 members of the priestly family, along with everyone else in Nob including men, women, children, babies, and animals. 
and only one person escaped, Abiathar, Ahimelech's son, who fled the scene and found David. So as the story tumbled out, David's holy anger burned. That night or a few days later, David sat down and wrote Psalm 52, a condemnation of Doeg and every other person who tries to grow strong by destroying others. Doeg's epitaph is that he loved evil and refused to make God his stronghold. And that's talked about in verses 3 and 7 of Psalm 52. So we're never told what happened to Doeg. You know, he probably got a promotion from Saul that day and a reward of some kind, but we don't really know. But we can be certain of one thing. In time, God brought Doeg to everlasting ruin. David, on the other hand, was like a green olive in the house of God. A green olive tree, I should say, in verse 8. That tree is used several times in the Psalms as an image of the godly person. But the olive tree has some interesting qualities that sharpen the image of what it means to walk in confident trust in the Lord. The first is that an olive tree has a remarkably long life. The second is that it's evergreen and hardly, even in harsh and, or sorry, that it's an evergreen and it's hardy even in harsh environments. And its fruit is valuable and satisfying. It's life-sustaining and life-enriching. So the person who trusts in wealth will end up like an uprooted tree. In verse 5 of Psalm 52, the person who trusts in the Lord will flourish. I will wait on your name, for it is good. Verse 9. Eugene Peterson wrote this. Every time we enter a holy place and become aware of the presence of a holy God, we leave either better or worse. If we come to separate ourselves from common people and things, we will almost certainly leave worse. We will leave, as Doeg did, ready to impose our notion of right on someone else, forcing our idea of God on another, full of indignation, crusading in a holy war. But if we enter hungry and needy, letting ourselves be vulnerable before God, bluntly, even belligerently asking for what we need, we will almost certainly leave better. We will leave as David did, grateful simply, to be alive, amazed to know that God is with us, that the most holy sacrament is food for our most everyday needs. Lord, we are in desperate need of you. Sometimes I think we're, we lack substance in what we ask from you. Sometimes I think we also lack substance in giving you praise for all that you give us, for all that you have done for us. And so tonight, Lord, or today, we ask that you would show us your way. Help us to be strong and ask you for what we really need in our lives. You know what those matters are. You know where we're all at. You know if we have things in our lives that require forgiveness. You know if there's people against us. You know if we, you know, are in, in need of finances or work or whatever the circumstances are. Most importantly, you know what our walk with you is like. So, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to turn to you with all of our needs and that we would not be lackluster in what we ask for but that we would not also demand and expect things that aren't your will. Lead us, guide us, show us what you would have us do with our lives and help us to focus on all that you've done for us. We give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory and honor. In your holy name, we pray. Amen.